a trained monkey? No, he's a cat. We're one o'clock. Is it? It's time. Okay. Nope, stay there. With my <laughs> stick? Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, starting off really well, as you can see. <laughs> um, we are here to answer a long list of questions about stick chairs and chairs in general, and also to do a couple demos. And if you stay till the end on the live stream, we even have a special uh, uh, announcement. A teaser. A very, a teaser, which will not be in the video uh, that is, uh, we'll, we'll clip later. So if you do stick it out, you will be not very impressed, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, so Megan's gonna go behind the camera for a while because some of this is gonna involve me doing things with my hands and I'm not always sure what to do with them and I don't wanna, like, so. Uh, I can do this with the stick though. I know you can, so. Bye. So we'll get started here. Okay, first up is even after several internet searches, I cannot find an informative explanation of the difference between a back stool and a chair. Can you help? What is the difference between a back stool and a chair? And the answer is there is no difference. Uh, there, uh, back stool and side chair, there is no difference. There's, they're kind of the same, different names for the same thing. So most of us think of as a back stool as a stool that has had a, a flat board added as a back. Um, that's a back stool. Other people think of a back stool as a simple stool that had sticks added to it to make a back. That is also a back stool, but mo the modern word now is uh, side chair. So it, historically, the mixing of these terms can cause a mess, uh, but you just call it whatever you want. All right. Question two from Steve. I'm using a hand reamer in a Sapele seat and I'm getting oval shaped holes. Is this a technique problem? Is my wood too hard? My practice holes in pine aren't perfect, but don't have as much of an oval shape. So I guess my real request is for some troubleshooting tips for traditional hand reamers. Traditional hand reamers, such as uh, this one from Ilya Bazari. Uh, your hole is going to be oval. Um, always when you, uh, when you take a round uh, cone and stick it into a plane at an angle, you're going to create a, an oval shaped hole. Uh, the, the question is whether you're making a hole also kind of uh, elliptical. And uh, chances are you're not. What I would do is after you ream the hole, is make a tenon, see if it fits. If it fits, then the uh, ovalness, the ovality is fine. If uh, for some reason it is longer in one dimension than it is in the other, then you have a problem. Uh, typically that problem is that you are cutting the face grain of the seat and uh, that's easier to cut than the end grain of the seat, which is more recalcitrant to use a Megan word. Uh, and really the solution to that is a sharp Reamer, make sure that the edges are uh, nice and wicked sharp and constant downward pressure. And don't let the reamer uh, overload. So if uh, this is all filled up with junk, it's uh, not going to scrape and it's gonna absolutely have a problem in the end. Break. All right, uh, this next one's from David. I am six foot five inches tall and I'd like to know which changes to standard chair measurements you suggest to make a truly comfortable perch. Maybe also include how to make it perfect for all of the four foot eleven woodworkers. There are likely more of those around. Well, I, I, commercial. A lot of this is, of course, covered in the stick chair book. Is how to make the uh, the, the chair comfortable for different heights and si uh, widths of people and their lengths and different depths. Very shallow people are. We don't like to make chairs for shallow people, um, but. Uh, the first thing I want to say about chair comfort, and this will apply to all of our things with chair comfort, is that you need to learn to sit in a stick chair. Uh, you know, asking a stick chair to be as comfortable as a lazy boy chair is, is folly. Uh, it really is. That's like asking, a, I want a finish for a tabletop that has no VOCs is, you know, impenetrable by nuclear weapons is easy to apply and looks beautiful and costs nothing. Um, there, there are trade-offs 
in all cases. Now, you can maximize the comfort of a stick chair in a lot of ways. The, one of the most important is the, uh, the chair height. So we have this dimension right here. Does this look weird on the internet? Okay, this is called the popliteal height. It's the distance from the bottom of your heel to right underneath the knee. And if you set the chair height for the seat uh, too high, then you're gonna cut off blood uh, right behind the knee. And that is a, a number one source of discomfort. So make sure that you get the seat height correct. Then the other thing, and we'll show this on the internet too, is you know, where is, your, where is this lumbar? Uh, this lumbar, you, know, you want to find the lumbar spine, and that's usually somewhere between 8 and 10 inches off of the seat. And you want to provide some support, uh, some pressure to push that lumbar forward a little bit uh, so that you support both the lumbar and, and the shoulders. Uh, so in a stick chair, uh, such as this one, could we show this stick chair? Um, you know, this is set up for somebody who's about 6'3 or 6'4. Uh, this is a popliteal height of about 17 inches. This is my chair that I sit in uh, every morning. I'm not 6'4, I'm 6'3 and 5'8. <laughs> I am. And uh, so this is uh, my popliteal height, which is about 17, uh, 17 inches. And this lumbar, uh, which we call this uh, the arm bow, this is the shoe or the doubler, that this pressure right here is positioned right where my lumbar spine is. And you know, if you get it about eight inches, sorry Bean, off of the uh, chair, you're gonna get most people. And some people have the lumbar up a little higher. And so if you're going to, uh, if you're gonna try to get a chair comfortable for somebody, what I would do is take that person to a store with a bunch of chairs and have them sit in them and tell you what is comfortable and what is not comfortable and don't let them sit in the lazy boy. Okay. Uh, from Jim, is it true that the perfect saddle forms a seal around the posterior which can only be broken by the release of gas? I think that's a joke? Yes. Okay. Ha! But really, but B-U-T-T, is it possible, reasonable, to saddle a seat in a completed armless chair, or will the back spindles totally get in the way of making it too much of a pain in the ass? Wow, a lot of butt jokes all in one. Uh, I know. All in one. Uh, that is the strangest question I'm sure we will receive. Is uh, no, no, it's not. Okay. Um, can't you know? This is if, if we have an existing chair, how can we saddle it? And the answer is you can. I mean, it's actually not that hard. Um, because the scorp, or in shave, whatever you want to call it, has this very narrow blade, uh, you can get right up against the, uh, the back there. And you can do almost 99% of the saddling all in this direction by hollowing out, you know, kind of where the, the butt area goes and these little troughs for the legs. Uh, so yeah, you, you definitely can do it um, with a nice flat uh, in shave or scorp like this one. You know, it's not it's not like an O. It's it's more like a it has this flat area that makes that much easier uh, to to do what you're suggesting. So if you have to choose an in shave, I would probably get a pretty flat one. But yeah, absolutely go for it, and then you can finish it up. Uh, with this you will have to pull this toward you a little bit, but that's not that big a deal and then don't be afraid to get out the sander Sanding is not a sin All right, and Nathan asks about species What species you use when making stick chairs or does species really matter? I know there are aesthetic reasons for certain species and others work more easily than others While there is yet a third group that accepts finish with better results, but does any of this really matter? Uh, what species can you use for stick chairs? And the answer is almost any species. Uh, rung what you brung. Uh, dance with the one you got. We make stick chairs out of walnut. We make stick chairs out of cherry. We make stick chairs out of oak, maple. Uh, what, whatever is local to you uh, will probably work. I think there are very few species that are too weak uh, to, to be used in, um, uh, in a stick chair. Uh, the, the real question is not species, but grain, and you need to get the grain running from one end to the other of a stick, which is a, a big part of the beginning of the stick chair book, is how do I get this walnut stick, which is just from the lumber yard, it's not rived, but how do I get the grain running continuously from one end to the other so it's at the maximum strength that it can be. Great. Uh, from Jacob, 
Most boards I find that are wide enough to become chair seats are flats on. Is there ever an issue with the seat cupping and causing the legs to no longer be flat against the floor or the chair to distort because of this flat song grain? Right, so do we want the heart side of a seat to be up or do we want the heart side of the seat to be facing down? Um, as, if, if the chair is gonna have a clear finish on it, then basically the answer is use the prettiest side up. If you have a choice, I'm going to want to put the heart side, the inside of the tree, facing the buttocks. And that way, um, if the wood does distort, it's going to distort like this, and it's going to bring the legs in a little bit. If you have stretchers, it's not going to be a problem. And if you don't have stretchers, it probably won't be a problem. So just like with cabinet making, uh, heart side, we like to go uh, out or up. So that's my answer. All right. LAP, has just, that's Lost Art Press, has just released two books on chair making, The Stick Chair Book and Make a Chair from a Tree. They seem to give unique approaches to chair making. Which of these approaches do you think would be best for a beginner? Should you buy Make a Chair from a Tree or The Stick Chair Book, right. basically? Um, I think it depends on, well, which form appeals to you more. I think you can do either um, as a beginner. I, th I know people who have <clears throat> built a stick chair and built a Jenny chair, and that was the first thing they ever made. So you'll be fine either way. I would say that uh, one of the things about stick chairs that I like and why I prefer to make these is that I don't need uh, green wood necessarily. Um, the Jenny chair, it doesn't require green wood. You can get away with, um, with kiln dried wood, but it is, um, it's whole ethos is around green wood. That's the, that's the foundation of it and the, and the, the way that the, uh, the legs compress on the tenons. Stick chairs, it doesn't matter. I just go to the lumber yard and buy the stuff that looks uh, straight. Okay. I like the Jenny chair better, I'm sorry. I can fit more of them around my dining table. That's really why. You're fired. <laughs> I don't work for you. I, I know. Okay. Um, and now for my question. I ignored all the praise, but thanks for that uh, ahead of it. It is about the comfort of stick chairs. In particular, does the arm bow and the doubler on models that have one press into the middle of your back? I have never sat in one and just wonder if all the lovely back support from the vertical spindles is marred by the horizontal pressure on your spine where your back meets the arm bow. So let's go back to the bean chair here. This is a little bit repetitive from the last uh, question on comfort and it's, the answer is ab absolutely yes, uh, <laughs> that the arm bow should press into your uh, lumbar spine. And the way you get it to do that is by tilting the chair seat back. Ow, almost drew blood. By tilting the chair seat back about, about maybe two fingers, and that makes your, your butt then slides back. You're gonna be a star. Uh, slides back, and then your lumbar encounters the, uh, the arm bow, and then your shoulders come back, and your shoulders shouldn't encounter this, shoulder should encounter this and uh, that supports your shoulders and if this isn't too far forward or too far back that will support your lumbar and you will be in heaven also i think it's important maybe to show that there's an angle on the yeah this one is pretty um i would say you know modern because i put a, sure. a, a chamfer you can't feel this, but you can feel the fact that this feel. this corner doesn't exist. Right, right. So the chamfer or rounding needs to happen so, here. Yeah. The cat on the chair and sit on the cat, and that makes it really comfortable. Yeah, cat skins. Cat skins make stick chairs very comfortable. <laughs> uh, it says we have a weak connection here, and I guess we'll just keep going because that says good connection. And all right. As we were. Um, from Andy, when carving seats, Peter Galbert uses depth holes to guide his carving. If one is trying to design holes should be and how deep to make them. This might be in my PDF of the stick chair book, but I haven't gotten that far yet. Yeah, you're gonna have to ask Peter Galbert about uh, <laughs> about depth holes. I, you know, 
everybody does seats a little bit differently. I think depth holes are great. Uh, Mike Dunbar takes a cirque saw and sets the depth, the plunge depth to whatever he wants, half an inch, or, and then does a plunge cut down here uh, at, the, at the lowest point of the seat. I just go at it with, uh, with the, the scorp, and then I will put you know, a straight edge across the seat and see if it looks like I want it to. And then when I think I'm close, I'll jump up on the bench and put my butt in it and see if it feels right. Um, I, uh, I, I also prefer a, a generally a, a more sallow, shallow saddle. Boy, say that five times. <laughs> Don't. Um, uh, than uh, most Windsor chair or forest chair makers. So I, I'm looking for like a 3 8 inch saddle and so I, I don't want to overshoot that and make a real deep saddle. So I'm not going to use depth holes. All right, uh, let's see here. In the picture in the email about this video session, I see the leg mortising being done while the seat is still pretty rough. So I'm wondering if and how this order, the order of operations might differ from the cabinet type work I'm more familiar with. In other words, what do you recommend as the basic order of operations when making a stick chair? Yeah, so you're going to see rough on the underside of a, of a seat. I start with rough stock and uh, I'm going to leave the underside rough. I may not even clean it up if it doesn't look too offensive. But the basic order of operations, and we'll go back to this very deadly chair here. <laughs> it's got some real pointy parts to it, so be careful, people. Is uh, Chairs are built from the ground up. At least that's my order of operations. Uh, I make the legs, I make the seat, I mortise the legs into the seat, and uh, then I uh, kind of skip the saddle, because I don't want to saddle the seat until I am sure that this upper carriage is correct. If I totally screw up this upper carriage, then this becomes a stool. <laughs> so, and that's going to have a different saddle, or maybe not any saddle. So I get the arms fit with the sticks, then I saddle the seat, and then we continue to work our way up, assembling the upper carriage, finishing off the arms and the hands, and then get moving up to the comb. And then make pretty, and then finish. What if you have an H stretcher or some other part of the undercarriage? Well, that's all part of at, at the ground. So like when you make the legs, I make the stretchers. So if you have a, a H stretcher or X stretcher or whatever, that's gonna all happen right at the beginning. What about a crinoline stretcher? I don't know what those are. I've never <laughs> made one. Okay. I sound, crinoline sounds like some kind of tiger bomb or something that you would put on something that's irritated. <laughs> no? Uh, I, I have no idea. Um, I'm going to stop trying to be funny. Uh, where am I? Can you show where, how, and when you would use a 14 degree taper versus an 8 degree taper? Where would one find an 8 degree reamer and tenon cutter? Lee Valley or are they custom made? That's from John. Okay, we'll I have to go back to the, the pointy chair. Um, so he, he's asking about the conical legs and should the legs be um, uh, you know, like 14 degrees or 6 degrees or 8 degrees. I mean, there are a lot, you know, should, should it be, you know, more like this or more like this? The mortise. Yeah, the mortise and the tenon. Well, sure. But, and the matching tenon both have to be the same. And the answer is, if you're going to use a, a if you're going to have a strut legs, so this doesn't have an undercarriage like, a, a, you know, stretchers across it. So we call this a strut leg chair. Um, if you're going to use a strut leg chair, then you're either going to want to use the more dramatic, um, uh, you know, lean or angle, because when the angle is more dramatic, the tenon is going to be thicker at the base. So you're either going to want to use this more dramatic angle, or you're just going to want to use straight cylinder so that you have the most beefy, robust tenon to deal with, you know, all the pressure of the sitter. If you have an undercarriage, then you can use whatever you like. Uh, the, the reason a lot of people like these reamers, which have a very shallow angle, is it doesn't remove a lot of wood. So it's less work. It's less work when making the mortise. It's less work than making the tenon if you're doing it by hand. So uh, that's really how it comes down to for me. Strut leg chair, I do this, or cylinders. Uh, if I have an undercarriage, I can do whatever I want. Okay. Oh. Here. In addition to showing how to ream the mortise, could you or Chris 
Chris, also show how you rough out the tenon efficiently. Basically, what do you do before using the tenon cutter as a big pencil sharpener? Okay, uh, we'll go over here and I'll show you how I do that. Um, you, there's a variety of ways to do it. What I do is um, my tenon cutter is gonna have a 5 8 inch tip. And then it's going to, uh, when, it, the, when it finishes the tenon, the tenon's about an inch and a sixteenth when it's a 14 degree uh, taper. That's over about three and an eighth inches here. So what I do is I take a 5 8 inch bit and I make uh, a small target hole in the, the center of the, uh, the leg. And then, because I don't have a shave horse and I'm not fancy with a, a draw knife or anything, I just push it up against a stop and I jack off to it, to that line. So I'm just tapering the last, you know, four or five inches or something. And then as I get closer, I can do it one-handed like this. So I just keep working until I've roughed out. And it doesn't take too long. Um, it takes longer when there's a camera running. And then after I get to that line, uh, I then I, this will enter the tenon cutter like a giant pencil sharpener, and it'll shave it'll shave it. But I just use a jack plane and really just rough it out really quick. Okay. Could Chris talk about his process for figuring out rake, uh, rake and splay angles? What does he do for prototypes? If you build something that isn't quite right, what's it meant? Five degrees? Two degrees? Well, when I make prototypes, I don't build, yeah, I build prototype chairs, but those really aren't about rake and splay. They're about the whole, the whole kebab. You know, how does it look? How does it sit? What are the details? If I'm just trying to figure out rake and splay, I'm going to go uh, get wire hangers. And um, you might not, I'm told you don't have wire hangers in Canada. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, just some like, you know, 14 or 12 gauge wire from the home center. Um, and I make a half scale model and epoxy the legs in. Then I take, and this is all covered in the book, of course, how to do this. I bend these legs until it looks like a chair. Uh, that it lo and I can see in three dimensions uh, how the legs look and if it, if it looks good. And if it looks good to your eye on a prototype, it'll look good um, uh, as a chair. Excuse me. But the second part of your question is what if you uh, you know, you're prototyping and you drill uh, your mortises and uh, you think, ah, that's not enough. The nice thing is with a, any reamer, uh, but especially with an electric reamer, is you can change or correct uh, the, the rake and splay by, you know, probably at least 10 degrees, pro probably 15 or 20 um, if you want. But uh, generally, I don't do that unless I'm doing it accidentally. So just make a model uh, with wire hangers and a, and, a, and a piece of plywood, and that'll give you most of your answers. Farley asks, I'm new to chair building. Well, actually, he states that. He asks, in your new stick chair book, you mentioned that a stool could be a good starter project. Do you have any suggestions for a stool plan? Um, sure. Uh, the Anarchist Design Book has a, <laughs> a couple. Oh, sorry, I, I'm not... <laughs> But it does. Uh, it's a good place to start. There's a staked saw bench uh, in there, and there's a, a staked high stool, and then also it shows how to make um, a nice uh, four-legged stool that has stretchers, so it'll get you introduced to an undercarriage. So there's a whole world of stools to explore in the Anarchist Design Book. World of Stools, that was the original title. Yeah, we convinced him otherwise. He's going to have a brown cover. Oh, God. What steps do you go through to saddle a seat, or would you like to come back to that one? Um, no, saddling a seat. Uh, I'll show you basically with this little model, like having a little Barbie, where I like to be touched and stuff. It's and, Barbie's workshop. It's, sorry, Barbie. That no, no, that wasn't. <laughs> uh, so I do ninety-nine percent of my saddling with a scorp or an in-shave, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, secure the seat with a two by four under it and put it in my bench vise. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take long strokes this way toward the front of the seat. And I'm just going to keep going until this area is, is as deep as I want to be. And that's this, with the in-shave? 
This is with the scorp slash end shave. So almost all of this is going to be with the scorp slash end shave. And so I'm getting down to like this part right here. And here's the pommel and here are kind of the, where the leg troughs are. And then after I get to that point, then I'm going to start working on these uh, holes for the legs. I'm not going to touch the pommel, but I'm going to go with the grain and uh, kind of scoop these out, including any kind of curve that's down here. And after I get the curve here and the curve here looking good, then I'm going to go back to uh, across the grain and uh, sort of round this area uh, of the leg holes up into this, this shallow bowl area. That's really all it is when I do a, a seat with a pommel. And then I, this is sort of like a smoothing plane. This is the travisher. And I come and we have a visitor. Maybe. Okay. Uh, and then I do the exact same operations, um, exact same operations uh, that I did with the, uh, with the scorp and the in shave. Uh, then I uh, scrape in a little sanding and, and we're done. Okay. Uh, Gary says, I've got some experience making chairs. Um, I've got the ADB and will be purchasing the digital stick chair stuff soon. From an academic perspective, should I start with the stick chairs and the ADB before making the chairs in the new book? What's the preferred sequence or progression? Uh, we do have a visitor. Uh, academically, uh, don't do anything academically. Instead, um, I strongly recommend against it. Yeah, academically didn't help either of us. That's right. Emotionally helps yourself. Uh, just pick the chair that looks the nicest, uh, that really lights the fire under your bum, and build that one as your first one. You know, it's it'll be fine. But the only one, the only design in the stick chair book that is probably not for beginners is the one with the bent components. It's a little trickier, uh, and uh, but other than that. It's all pretty, they're all pretty much the same. Paul says, I have access to six quarter elm air dried for three years. Is this too thin, is this too thin for a seat that will have a shallow saddle? Is six quarter elm too thin for a seat? And the answer is probably not. I have seen um, stick chairs that look like they were five quarter and have survived just fine. Um, what you can do, however, is where is our, could you grab the Moravian stool? Sure. Um, there is a historic solution that's been used by lots of cultures, and that is when they have a thin seat, is they will artificially, or I guess it's, it is not artificial, it's, it's official, um, <laughs> you add battens to the underside, and these battens thicken the area at the leg mortises. You see this in German culture, Swedish cultures, we, you know, all the British cultures. Uh, so when the seat's too thin, uh, just thicken it up. And so these don't even have to be, these are in a sliding dovetail. Uh, that's fine. I've seen them nailed and pegged on and they last just fine as well. Okay, so this is a long one, so listen closely. Right. I've made a couple stick chair shaped objects at this point. One of the things I've struggled with is getting the leg tenons from their initial square to round-ish. I like to use a pencil sharpener type fixture with a plain iron and a reamed hole uh, that I've seen from Tim Manny and Pete Galbert. I've tried a few things such as rough turn on a lathe first, which is offensive to some and is usually buried in my shop from disuse, coarse knocking off of some of the corners. This bit seems the most fiddly of the whole process and no matter how I've completed it, I feel there's a better way I should know about. I figure you've tried many methods and might have something to say on pluses and minuses of various processes of getting from square to roundish. Um, is that? Is it? Jeremy. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> um, our, I would first make your stick octagonal. That always helps, you know, get you, get you closer to, uh, you know, roundish. Uh, that makes it easier to hit your target. Going back to what I showed earlier, if you draw a target, on here at, on the end and work towards that target, you're, you're probably going to have better luck. And also be aware of, you know, how far back you should be tapering. If the taper is over two inches, uh, you know, if the tenon is over two inches, uh, then maybe you want to taper back four or five. If it's over three inches, which is uh, more typical for what I use, you're going to go back like six inches or a little more. Knowing those two things, 
you do that, it's gonna be it's gonna be fine. And you know, if you turn them on the lathe, who cares? I mean, I, I, I when I have to do like everybody's legs for a class or something, or a whole bunch for um, for gosh knows what, I'm gonna do them on the lathe, and I'm not gonna have any problems sleeping at night. <laughs> All right. Uh, recent from Travis. Recently finished my first Welsh American stick chair and find it so comfortable. To adapt the form to a dedicated dining chair, would you raise the seat a little higher off the ground and reduce the lean in the back? Uh, the chair height, you know, it should be somewhere between 16 and 17, maybe 17 and a half inches. Uh, that's fine for dining. Um, you know, you get lower seats or for lounging. Um, I, tr I like a slightly lower seat. The, the standard is 18, and I think that's really too high for uh, about you know, 20, 25% of the population. So I'm gonna, no matter what, I'm gonna stick to like 16 and a half, 17, something like that. As far as the back lean goes, um, you can go from anywhere from about 10 degrees to 20 degrees for a dining chair, and you'll be fine. Um, I like 20 degrees. It allows you to sit back. Uh, we talk a lot at our dining table. It's not a, a quiet affair. I like to be able to eat and I have one bar of support and I'm sitting up straight and I eat and then you can lean back, but it's not like you're in a lazy boy at all. So try somewhere between 10 and 20. Usually people settle between 15, 17, 20, something like that. And is that a one finger or a two finger lean? No, that's the lean for the back. The seat should be, the seat should be tilted as well and the seat can be tilted uh, from front to back. Uh, one, maybe one and a half fingers, so maybe about three quarters, maybe an inch, uh, tilt from front to back. Okay, second question from Travis. How did you price your work when new to making, when, uh, sorry, how did you price your work when new to making versus now? How did I price my work at the beginning and how do I price it now? Yes. Um, basically, what can I get away with? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, 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 I mean, and I mean that at the beginning, that's what it was oh. like, what can I uh, aspire to? And when I started making chairs, a lot of the people around me were selling them for uh, about $600. And so that's where I started, was at about $600. And that was 20 years ago. That was 18 years 18 ago, years. yeah. Uh, almost coming up on 19. Um, and, then the second question is, did they sell at that price? <laughs> and they sold okay, you know, they sold, it was okay. Uh, you're not gonna get rich making chairs. I think chairs are a good side hustle, for lack of a better word, a side gig, and have always been that for me. <laughs> um, now I'm charging 12 to 1400, and a lot of people think that's too low. My chairs sell very quickly. I think it's fine. Uh, I have about $100 in materials. Uh, I, I probably spend less than eight hours on a chair at the bench, unless the finishing is, is complicated. Um, and then you pay me to do that usually. Sometimes I'll pay <laughs> Megan to do that if I don't want to do the complicated finish. Um, and I also am weird and stubborn in that I want, I don't want my chair to be something I couldn't afford. And so I like the fact that my chairs are owned by firefighters, uh, you know, kind of normal people. Uh, they're not just owned by the ultra wealthy, and they, but that's a personal problem. I mean, if I were smart, I would I would ask twenty four hundred. Okay, so you're not smart. I'm stupid as stupid as ever, <laughs> Arkansas boy. All right, and Travis's last question is: Do you keep diligent logs of time spent per project? I used to do that, and before I got a feel for what it takes me, and so now I don't at all. Um, I mean, I used to have a little score sheet and I would be clocked in at such and such a time, did these operations, <laughs> felt like crap, weather was cloudy. Uh, but now I don't, uh, I don't do any of that. I've, I've, I've got it pretty much nailed. I know how long it'll take me to make a chair. Okay. Rick wants to know, uh, he would like a four stick comb back similar to the St. Fagan's inspired chair on page 240 of your new stick chair book. Really, the question is though, what modifications do I need to make to a six stick comb back chair to make it into a four stick comb back? Other than simply subtracting two back sticks, do the four long sticks then need to be thicker? The four long sticks do not need to be thicker. I pretty much stick with five eighths uh, diameter for all my sticks, and, and that's fine. Uh, if we go back to the, the, the deadly chair, the deadly chair is hibernating right now. The deadly uh, chair is asleep. Yes. Um, 
So this could very easily be a, a six stick chair if I just brought up these two sticks. Uh, so really the changes are minor. Um, the shoe uh, on a six stick chair starts here and here. Uh, the shoe on a four stick starts uh, here and here. So, you know, between these, these sticks, uh, there aren't really a, a lot of changes. You, you can make it really complex or you can uh, be like me and that's keep it pretty simple. But even when you're not using a shoe or doubler, uh, you can still use six sticks there, right? At senior chairs with out of that where they have multiple sticks. If you have a bent arm, yeah. then you know you, you, your options are open and the shoe doesn't, there is no shoe. Right. So you can have a, I built nine stick chairs uh, for the back. With no doubler. With no doubler, right. yeah. As long as you have a continuous grain sure. arm. Okay. I was making it more complicated, sorry. That's all right. That's what I do. You frame me back and, okay, sorry. Uh, Chris has mentioned shopping for dowels at the home center. I've looked through the piles, but I'm not quite sure what I'm looking for. Can Chris walk us through this? A little bit, yeah. It's kind of hard to show, um, and it takes some experience. The first thing I'll tell you is uh, take the dowels that you have bought and examine them and, and say, oh, look, this one has really prominent cathedrals on it. And uh, yeah, look at these real prominent cathedrals. And then do a thing that I talk about in the stick chair book, which is the uh, sledgehammer test, is uh, put it up on a couple, um, you know, propped it up here and here, but prop it up on a couple blocks and then hit it with a sledgehammer if it survives and hit it like you're hammering a nail. If the stick survives, it'll, it's probably a good chair stick. Uh, that's, and it, I know that sounds stupid, but it's an, honestly, it's a good way to educate yourself about it. But you can't do that at the home center. Yes, well, you, you could, can, but... You can, you just, might, you just might meet some happy security people. Um, uh, so what I'm looking for is when I see some uh, prominent uh, cathedrals, like on this one, I, I, I'm going to look for the grain kind of running, it's running at an angle. And so that's short grain. So this is this is a big thing. This thing is going to snap really easily. <laughs> Never me, demonstrate. You want me to do that for you? Never demonstrate. Um, the, what I'm looking for in a good dowel is uh, I'm, I'm going to see the uh, medullary rays uh, running on this uh, stick, and they're kind of they're kind of flat and mottled, um, and in comparison to the medullary rays on uh, it, it's twin and the medullary rays look like arrows. So if the medullary rays are, are fairly like flat and just kind of like don't really have much arrow to them, that's a hint that the grain is running straight through. Uh, and, and when you see prominent arrows, like these are making like little pointy arrows, uh, that, that generally means that there's strong grain direction in that. Uh, the sledgehammer test is my favorite though. And, uh, Don't you also run them over the floor to make sure they're straight? Um, yeah, like I'll run them on the floor because that just points out any ones that are really warped. That doesn't talk much about grain direction, but I would probably reject this one out of hand uh, if it rolled like that at the home center. Um, see that one? That's a, see that's a perfect uh, dowel from uh, from Lowe's, and uh, and you can see how it rolls nicely uh, and has you know the. The grain is running straight through on the flat sawn side, and the medullary rays are just this kind of flat modeled uh, look. I hope that helps. Okay. It's moving around. Sorry about the camera work, people. Uh, how do you get chair parts from woods that don't rive well? Cherry, for example. Um, that obviously is, and I'm sorry to say, a huge part of the book. Um, the, the trick is, and we're going to go to the board here, is when I have a board in front of me, so we're just, we go to the lumber yard and we have these boards, uh, the most important thing I'm going to look at is the edge grain. I don't, I, unlike, like when I'm shopping for grain, but when I look at the edge grain, I'm looking for just dead straight uh, grain lines all the way up and down through the edge grain. And then... If I find that board, I'm going to pull it out and then I'm going to look at the face and I'm going to see if it's, you know, if the cathedrals run like this, then uh, that's going to be a hard board to split. But if the 
if the cathedrals are really shallow, meaning they kind of look like islands instead of uh, big arrows, then that's going to be a pretty ideal, uh, pretty ideal board for splitting. And uh, we'll, we'll split as readily as, as oak with just a little bit of wave. Uh, but I, I split walnut, dry, kiln dried walnut, kiln dried oak, kiln dried cherry, kiln, kiln dried maple. Um, and, and as long as I do this, I don't have a lot of problems. So you're saying that these do rive well, despite what you might have heard. Or yeah, can. Yeah, I mean, oak rives, oak rives, you know, it's just easy to rive. Uh, this might take a little more effort, it, but it, it's not like the grain is interlocked. It just doesn't pop apart like oak. So. So if you were making a chair out of, say, hickory, no. you wouldn't bother? Uh, no, hickory rives really easily. Does it? It's like, what? Well, oh, yeah, hickory is a great chair wood. Um, it's just really hard. It's really recalcitrant uh, <laughs> after it dries and everything. So it's a, it's a very rivable wood. Oh. Uh, woods like locust. That's what I was going to say. Something interrupt. Yeah. Elm, like those will like just... Or Sapili, some of those fancy interlocked woods. Those will just make you crazy. So with those, you're just not going to ride them. You'll saw them. Yeah, yeah. So that's the other option is even if you don't rive up this board, you can have marching orders for how to saw it on a bandsaw <laughs> or with a handsaw. Okay. Um, you sort of already answered this, but what is the advantage, if any, of using a six degree reamer or any other angle? Uh, well. The just to repeat, the low angles mean you don't have to remove as much wood, so the six degree. And the higher angle means that your tenon's gonna be thicker, so you can use a strut leg chair without any stretchers. Okay. I noticed that you complete the under chair, under, under chairage. <laughs> I noticed that you complete the undercarriage of your chairs before you level the feet. Do you measure down from the seat to determine where you want the stretchers to be, asks Tim. Yeah, you know, how do I position my undercarriage? And uh, that is basically off the seat. Some people uh, base it off the floor, and if you do that, you have to cut the legs to length before you position the undercarriage. Um, I, it doesn't make a huge difference to me, but I like to do it off the seat. So this is sort of a follow-up to your question about popliteal height, or your answer about popliteal height and lumbar support, but... If I'm only making a chair once, how can I make sure it's comfortable for the intended person? Prototyping? Are there story stick approaches like what I've seen done for Greenland's, Greenland style kayaks? Asked Greg. Um, if you're only making one chair, you're a nut. I mean, how can you make only one chair? Two I've, up I've only made one chair. Uh, yeah. I like okay. dovetails. Um, yeah. I, my uh, discussion before holds, which is, you know, study an existing comfortable wooden chair and uh, copy that. Uh, you know, even if you're not copying the style of it, copy where it touches the human body. Like, what is the seat tilt? Where is the lumbar? Where does it hit the shoulders? Where, how high are the arms? Uh, find, a, find a comfortable uh, Windsor chair or, or whatever uh, and, and, and make, that cop make a copy of it. Okay. I believe this will send us back to the... Uh Pointy the, chair. The sleeping chair. <laughs> the sleeping chair. Uh, Chris recommends a curved grain uh, in wood for the armrests. It would be helpful if he could elaborate on this and explain for those of us who are grain challenged what that means. For example, should I look for wood with grain that follows the shape of the armrests, will the chair self-destruct otherwise? We're going to do it on the board. Oh, okay. Uh, I don't want to let sleeping beans lie. Um, <laughs> You know, it's, 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 it's kind of hard to I explain entirely, but if I have just a standard, you know, kind of board that has edge grain, edge grain, and, uh, you know, cathedral grain in the center, I can, I can get an arm from this um, if I'm going to have a shoe on, on top of it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have, you know, the hand here. Nothing's drawing, right? Come on the hand here and then it's going to come around here and that's going to be half the arm. So the grain is straight through the hand in the part that's exposed and then the, the grain here, this is all covered by the doubler or the, the shoe which will make sort of a primitive plywood. So that's one way to get it uh, out of 
plain old flat sawn wood. Um, if you have a lot of rustic wood um, and you have something that has a knot in it, a big old nasty knot, you're also going to find that the grain curves around that knot all the way around the board and you can use that to get chair arms. Um, and so you can very easily find a chair arm here where the hand would be here and it would come around like this and the grain would be pretty much running, pretty much run continuously through the, uh, through the arm. So look for big nasty knots or use this approach. So the answer is yes, you should look for wood with grain that follows the shape of the armrest or you can use a doubler over it. Correct. Right? Okay. And finally, I'm going to try to make this chair a chair using my brace and wood owl auger bits. I'm interested to know what influenced Chris's move to power drills for chair building. Is the main advantage efficiency? Yeah, that's it. <laughs> yep. I mean, it really is. I, uh, you know, if you do it a lot uh, and you have tendonitis in your elbow uh, and you're getting older, uh, you appreciate um, the electricity for a small little niceties. I built all my first chairs, uh, you know, with brace and bit and. Um, and all that, and, and I, I love that and enjoy that, but my elbow, not so much. So uh, the, the, the drills allow me to stay a chair maker a lot longer, and that's really the honest answer. And if you're using pine, it's a lot more uh, forgiving. Oh, okay. if I were in pine, I could probably do it even without a, a bit. I would just like do this with a bit because it's right. so easy. If you made forest chairs. If I made forest chairs in pine, yeah, I would just, just take You just look at it? I would, yeah, I would bore it with my steely gaze. <laughs> uh, but, no. but I work, you know, I, have, I work in oak uh, and right. maple, and so uh, it's, it's no joke. Right. All right, uh, so we're going to do the demos. Yeah, I believe we've promised some demos. Yeah, I know, I know this is going long. So we're going to come in close here, and first I'm going to show you how, um, how I ream. Uh, yeah, come on over here by, um, <laughs> unfortunately. I have to come near you? Yes. Oh, God. All right. All right. So, this is a 5 8 inch hole that I have drilled uh, for the leg, a leg mortise. This is my baseline. This is my sight line. And this is a 23 degree uh, resultant. Uh, and this is what I'm going to follow as I ream that hole. So this is drilled at 23 degrees on this resultant, and now I'm going to ream it. Uh, most people um, use a reamer wrong. Uh, I don't know if they don't follow the directions or if the directions aren't clear to them, but they just put it in there and they just push and push until it almost catches fire. Um, and that's just not how it works. This is a scraper. And there is not a lot of area here for the chips to build up. So you've got to clear this area after every second of, or second and a half of reaming. So for me, this is what it looks like. I'm going to line up this with the uh, shell of the chuck. I'm going to set it for the lowest speed possible. And I'm going to... And that's it. So then I'm going to pull out, clear the... And then we'll do the second, uh, the second ream. Very small, short bites. And then I'm going to run away, because I forgot a tool. Don't look at my butt. I'm sorry. I know, there's nothing to see. Um, and then I'm going to test it with my dummy leg. And then I'm gonna bring this up here, and I can see that this is tilted back a little bit. Uh, from where I want to be ultimately. Can you see that gap? Yeah. If you come around on this side, you'll see it much better. Yes. A little bit. Okay. That's better. Right. So now I know that I want to, when I ream, I want to pull back a little bit as I ream. So that's what I'm going to do now. Okay. And once again, small bite. So I need to move this away from the shell of the chuck. Don't hurt the Vesper. Vesper can take it. So all I did was I just Englished it or Frenched it or finished it or Estonianed it a little bit back. I'm going to offend all the Europeans. You Kentuckied it. Yeah, I Kentuckied it. And I looks like I did pretty well. You did a great job. Oh, thanks, Megan. Uh, and now I'm going to feel under, <laughs> under here to see if I can feel a little nub. 
there, um, and I probably need to ream just a little bit more. So if, if this is the seat, so that the tenon will uh, emerge from the uh, from the seat. So you should be able to feel the end of your dummy leg. Yeah, I'll do it one more time. Out. All right. Do it one more time. Uh, I would ream once more. Once more into the reamer hole, my something. You just work one of Shakespeare. Nah. I'm so proud. So now I can feel that protruding. That's about where I want it to be. And I'm right dead on with the, the angle and uh, move on with the next one. All right. So that's how I ream. Small, small bites. Nothing's hot. Nothing's burnished in here. There should be no smoke. Uh, we can't really see you on this side. Okay. We're backwards. So let's switch places. Yeah. Because we're going to move over to the metal workers' vice here in a minute, but I'm going to talk about sharpening. Um, uh, sharpening the reamer is uh, one of the great mysteries. <laughs> I guess I get a lot of questions about it. Uh, for years, what I did is I took a you know like a 220 grit diamond paddle uh, and kind of just stoned this uh, interior ledge. You don't want to touch the outside, obviously, because that would change the diameter. Uh, but then. I uh, remembered I had this tool, and this is a carbide sharpener, and it is simply uh, a knife body, but it has uh, just this piece of carbide that has very sharp corners, and the carbide is obviously uh, sharper than the tool steel. So I use this to sharpen it, and it, I sharpen the reamer like every three chairs, uh, but let's go over to the uh, metal worker's vise, and I'll show you how I do it. The nice thing about this sharpener, this one's available from Lee Valley Tools. I think they call it the universal sharpener and it's 20 something dollars. So if you come over here, Megan, and what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to take this, uh, it's a carbide scraper, and I'm gonna tilt it toward me. And I'm going to refresh that edge. And it actually peels off a little bit of steel. So it scrapes a little bit of steel, and, and then that's all it takes right there. That is really quite sharp. And then I'm going to rotate it. Take the universal sharpener. We get no money from the sale of universal sharpeners. Except from you, kind reader. And when I get a, a nice edge there, I'm done. Don't worry if there's no burr or anything, it just sort of removes uh, the metal. And that's ready for another uh, three chairs. And I'll put some oil on it and put it away. So, those of you who have stuck around, ta -da! give me some music, maybe, and play me over. We're done. Uh. <laughs> you really need to hurry up because I have no more in this tune. Okay. Uh, this is our next Crucible product. Uh, we just got the first sample uh, back. So we are going to very soon be uh, releasing a cast, uh, hold fast, uh, not hold fast, <laughs> I'm an idiot, planing stop and eating. But the really cool thing about them, two cool things about them, is the way that they work. Uh, they are installed. This is the length of a spade bit. Uh, five eighths inch, you take a five eighths inch spade bit, you drill a full depth hole, and then this just taps right in perfectly. The corners are designed to cut the corners of a five eighths inch spade bit. It's the easiest uh, planing stop uh, you can install. And the other thing that's great about them is because they're cast, is they're gonna be much cheaper than if you had a blacksmith make them. So we're shooting for about 50 bucks uh, for a really nice looking um, uh, uh, planing stop that's based on uh, the angle and the teeth uh, from Rubo. So that's it. Oh, right. well, this is over. Say Ma goodbye, Chris. Goodbye, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Say goodbye, Bean. Be sweetie. Yeah, that's a goal. Yeah. Now you can get back to your regularly scheduled Sunday cat ranching. Yes. Bye, everybody.